What's going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer and Mike Goolsby here for this week's Mike Goolsby Show reacting to Notre Dame's 28-20 victory over BYU in Las Vegas Allegiant Stadium. Um, three straight wins now for Notre Dame um, off of that abysmal 0-2 start to the season. All is right. There's no concerns. Sunshines and rainbows, right, Mike? Amen. Amen. Wish I could have been at the game, bro. Um, that was one of my biggest takeaways from this week's contest against BYU was, uh, just the energy in that stadium. It was palpable and it was almost like a party type vibe. Um, and I really think the team fed off that. So yeah, we are, it's puppy dogs and cotton candy in the, the Notre Dame football world right now. Yeah. Yep, I'm sure we'll see fire Reese, fire golden, fire Freeman in the comments here on our YouTube chat in just a moment. Um, so yeah, certainly not sunshine. And play Angeli. Don't forget about playing Angeli, right? That might get rolled out <laughs> as well. Folks, please do hit the thumbs up on this video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more Notre Dame football and recruiting content. If you're listening via podcast, appreciate you as well. Uh, please leave us a five star rating uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, and of course, blueandgold.com is your home for Notre Dame Fighting Irish coverage. Um, the guys there do a fantastic job of, of covering this um, uh, Notre Dame football, men's basketball, women's basketball. You know, I cover recruiting, baseball. I mean, I um, really do a fantastic job and I'm um, definitely glad to have Mike Gould's be on our team for these videos. Um, and as well, you pop on the message board as well um, to uh, give your takes as well. So um, we're going to talk about all aspects of the game. Uh, and then we'll kind of break it down specifically and, and then look at what's next. So, folks, if you do – so that's kind of the outline for the show. But if you do have a, something you want to get to to Mr. Goolsby right away. Um, it's a very loose outline, Mike. Very so, loose outline. I mean, you know, we had, you know, our 45 minutes training, um, you know, early, earlier in the day for it. Being facetious. Um, but, yes – Yep, drop Super Chat, and uh, we, we will get to it. Of course, Super Chats are just for live audience, so you're watching back. Um, that's not something you're able to do. But all right, Mike, just kind of uh, other than the game atmosphere, which, yeah, um, all the folks I talk to, like, you know, the recruits and their families, just mm -hmm. uh, absolutely fantastic atmosphere. And Marcus Freeman um, discussed that, you know, felt like a home game, you know, talked about that. But um Getting into the actual game, just kind of your your general impressions, um, you know, for, for Notre Dame getting this dub. I think you got to talk about Drew Pine, um, and he, you know, pre-game watching him walking out in the field, the guy looked confident, um, and he played confident. Um, and that you know, that Tyler Buckner, obviously, we've moved past it, we've had to due to injury, but it's like. As I'm sitting here, to, sitting down, getting ready to do a show with you here, Mike, I'm like, man, what if we had started Drew Pine in the Ohio State game, in the Marshall game? Um, what would that all offensive look like? And maybe you're trying to move towards Tyler Buckner throughout the course of the season. But if you could have this offense with this level of execution, with this level of pass protection, uh, maybe being of utmost importance, top of the list in terms of things that have improved. We don't get any interior pressure like we did the first couple of weeks. Um, you've got a run game now. So it's like, gosh, I just wish you could go back in time and, uh, and get that level of execution with Tyler Buckner under center. But that being said, Drew Pine's playing really well. Um, Michael Mayer has been better than I think we could have anticipated. Um, so that obviously factors into Drew's level of success. It's pretty remarkable, though. Um, another big takeaway for me, Mike, and you know, really seeing it, I kind of felt it during the game, sort of watching it, and the, and the rewatch reaffirmed that. You're really starting to see a youth movement in the Notre Dame football program, which is a good thing in terms of young kids getting spot duty, but just the overall demeanor. This was a big game. Big game atmosphere. We came to play. It was a physical game. I think equally matched. If maybe BYU was a little bit more physical at times, but the kids came to play. They competed. 
And when I talk about that youth movement, they were, they played looser and they were having more fun. And like we, you and I have talked about ad nauseum on our show, Mike, or my show rather, <laughs> uh, like it's there, like you see kids sort of step outside of themselves and go make a play. And mm -hmm. we've been, you know, just dying to see it. And it's like, you know, you saw obviously Jaden Thomas, young kid making a play. I'm excited to see what he turns into as far as an offensive weapon, because as big as he is, if he's 6'4", 215, that's a true freshman. Yeah, you imagine he might creep into that 230 area. Could he be an interesting kind of tight end piece as his career progresses? But he really flashed 50-50 ball. Oh, what a godsend. Yeah, obviously, Michael Mayer Diggs is making plays, getting incrementally better and incrementally more confident and explosive each week, but makes a big play, 40-yard run, estimate consistent uh, plays. Even like on Pine's little play where he kind of just – he's going down, taking a sack, and he pops it to um, – Estimate. Estimate. And Mike, we've I've always been talking about like in big time football games, you need an element of that backyard stuff. And that's what we're talking about. And then defensively, um Bracey had the not, pick first play. Yeah, Bracey had a pick. Thank goodness. You know, it only took us shoot almost halfway through the season to get one, but we'll take it. Plus two in the turnover margin this game. Um, Jason Adamiola decided it was his day to show up. Um, interesting with the Lacey transfer and everything, and Prince Kali flashed a little bit, but there was more kids on the offensive side of the ball to me that were willing to really go make a play. And I think some of that's a byproduct of like a lot of talk on on the team culture. You know, in the locker room, Freeman's talking about the culture. Drew Pine's talking about the culture culture post game on the field. Um, but yeah, they just seem to play more freely than we've seen under a Brian Kelly in like a big time atmosphere. And this, this game to me was the most evident and that was my real big takeaway. And I'm thrilled to, to see it. You know, you, again, you can almost feel it, Mike. Um, speaking of someone who made a play, Prince Kali um, did, you know, it was a uh, hall of scrambling. And, that was and quick. I knew we'd get there. Kali, yeah, let's uh, talk about it. Credited with a sack. Uh, would you like to see Kali start next week? Appreciate the super chat. Just ND go. Yeah, because I figured you'd ask me, bro. I was like, okay, what's my starting three? And this is interesting because now you've got the the injury to Tariq Brace and we played so much nickel, and you're going to go into a Stanford game. Um, we'll, get, we'll lean on Tim Hyde, but, you know, it's my understanding Stanford's kind of like the physical Pac-12 team. Um, Suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're brutal. But I guess what my point is to get to this answer with Kali, start Kali at, at will, pick your poison, Um at Mike, whether it be Bertrand, Bauer, Kaiser, I would pick Kaiser. Bertrand's playing bad football. Um, so Kali at will, probably Kaiser at Mike. And try Marist at will. We've tried him everywhere else. But, you know, we might as well put him at offense eventually here. Uh, they've tried him so many different slots in the defense. But a kid like Marist really, really needs to play in space and he needs time to process before he pulls the trigger. And I do think he can run. We know he has length, and we know he can run. I think that Maris would be an interesting base package rover to me. But in that, it's uh, you keeps him on the field. I know the coaching staff has a lot invested in him. It keeps Maris on the field at rover. Slide Collie into Will, and then off we go. I mean, that's a lot of athleticism. But yeah, Collie looks fantastic, and. You know, somebody that works with athletes and Kali's like biomechanics, Mike, and like his movement skills and stuff like that. Like he's just got it. Yeah, he's he's a he's a substantially more explosive, better athlete than what you have. There's a little bit of an inexperience there, sure, but you know your starters, guys that have been in the program for two, three, four years, like they're not sticking their nose in there. They're not filling gaps, um, and. I just don't know if some of these guys have it in their DNA to do it. So why not stick the better athlete in there? You are you would consistently give up chunk plays in the run game anyway, so why not just um, roll the dice and go with a player like Kali who has more upside? Going back to the offensive side of the ball, um, I'm 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 Mister Unpopular Opinion guy all the time. You are your opinions are very popular. I feel like people just want to agree with you even if they don't like your opinion. But one thing that you you. I feel like at least in the, the, the vocal, whether it's a minority or majority, the, the vocalness uh, 
aspect of, of our YouTube chat. People don't like Tommy Reese. What, what have you thought about – obviously, I know you've liked Reese so far this season. Mm-hmm. What do you think about him against BYU? Um, I thought it was – I thought it was – uh, let me get my bearings. I got so deep in a linebacker talk, bro. I did a one. You did a hard one eighty on me. I think it was a. I think it was a, a well called game, well executed game. Guys were schemed open. If Michael Mayer had went down in the first quarter, I'd be freaking out because so much of the offense. I mean, if he had twelve catches, he must have had fifteen targets, um, which accounted for like you know seventy percent of Pine's success. So that yeah is worrisome. He I can't mean, have. Half of Pint's um, completions, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, you could see where we've schemed Jaden Th- Thomas open. Uh, a lot of this stuff is clear-out stuff. Like, we'll have Lindsey just run a vertical route, and then, they'll, like, they brought Holden Stays underneath. They did that with – that was a throw to the right. They did the same. So, it's a fine scheme as long as we're sticking to the run game. And Coach Freeman talked about that in the locker room at, at, at post game. He's like, that's Notre Dame football culture. It's O-line, it's D-line. And we've been talking about it throughout the course of the season. That was the identity they wanted to bring into the Ohio State game was play some bully ball. Uh, Reese got cute throughout the course of the season. We've kind of settled on playing bully ball um, and then running play action off the top of it. So I'm okay with it as long as the kids – and that's what I, I've been okay with Reese's schemes throughout the season. It's just the execution wasn't there, which he should shoulder some of that blame for – ball starts, holds, you name it, but they're playing much cleaner football now, um, and it shows. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you, you, the YouTube chat is, you know, knocking Reese for, for a couple play calls. I mean. Sure. It's just how it is. I mean, this is. It's just I, how it is. With Tim Hyde last night, it's like, this is football. Like, people miss tackles. You miss a throw. You miss a hole. Yeah. Like I didn't like the, I didn't like, I didn't like the, uh, the fourth and one goal line call. I didn't personally. either. I thought it was dumb. I thought it was obvious that they would throw to mare there. They're going to throw to Matt Salerno or. No, you don't throw it on fourth and one, man. I mean, you don't do that, but I think you create some sort of a movement versus just a downhill. I mean, there was no, there was no movement. There was no off tackle. There was no nothing. So it's like, I mean, you have to get linebackers to stretch and create a cutback or run to the edge, but just to run downhill like a bowling alley, um, it wasn't very creative. I didn't like that call, but I'm not going to crucify. I mean, football is a, a summation of like everything, right? So yeah. if you look at the entire body of work for the game, I think he did a good job. Uh, yes, these are human beings. This isn't AI, you know, calling plays, Mike. Oh, Mike, you just. You just touched. You just pulled on my heartstrings right there. I always like to say that these are people. Like it's mm-hmm. not Madden. I always say that. You get me, Mike. Uh, Lucas, yeah. this, this this cracked me up. Says Ghouls be a six three two fifty. We say something. <laughs> he he says something, and we nod and smile. <laughs> that's yeah, uh, that's fair. Milton fans, <laughs> that's so stupid. <laughs> Milton fan says you see BK waiting on the sidelines to yell at his quarterback last game. Also love the win, but linebackers need to get better. More throws to receivers. Um, yeah. Outside of colleagues, you know, you discussed him a little bit. I know you weren't thrilled about Maris Lee, a foul. Um, and, and again, you, you did just kind of talk about the linebackers, but um, just your overall thoughts on that group. Well, before we get into the linebackers, um, I did make a note just in terms of going back to like the human element, the human okay. piece of all of this. And that, you, you know, like you look at Reese, Reese is still a young coach. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, the guy's incredibly young to be. My age. Yeah, he's, he's a young coach. Coach Freeman is a young coach. Coach Freeman, bless his heart. He's in the post game uh, locker room speech and he's got notes in his hand. Like he's looking at his notes to give a post game victory speech. And I thought it was, for lack of a better word, like adorable. Like this guy's still learning how to do this. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then I kind of you kind of mix that in with what I'm talking about with a little bit of that culture shift with like kids are having a little bit more fun and playing a little bit more loose and making big plays and big games. I think Freeman deserves a lot of that credit. So I just want to throw that in there because I, I saw that post game. He was looking at his notes and I was just like, man, that's so that's like adorable. Like the guy's still learning how to do this. And we, you know, we think that these people are like infallible, right? And it's just like, no, they're human beings. Um 
when people sometimes have bad days at work and now Reese had a Reese called a good game. You would have, you would have uh, maybe called a couple different plays here and there, but you know, you live and you learn now to the linebacker play. They also had a bad day. Um, I put in my notes and I, dude, I'm telling you, I feel like uh, JD Bertrand's like my spirit animal, Mike, in a way, you know, like I can kind of relate to, cause the guy plays hard. And he has anxiety. Like you can just see he has a little bit of like play anxiety. I think that substitution with him not necessarily being the man anymore, like last year, um, he was your starter just based off of depth. And he played well because of it. Like, and that breeds confidence because I'm not going to rotate. I'm not going to get pulled off the field. Ends up having, you know, close to 100 tackles. This year, early in the season, there's all kind of rotation. Now he's got the two targeting penalties, and I think he's trying to, like, make up for lost time. And, uh, I mean, he's on the ground all the time. And, I mean, like, you know, somebody that, you know, again, trains kids, like, had a linebacker out there earlier today. It's like I'm teaching kids to key the running back, and then we can kind of feel the underneath stuff. It's key the back, and you can sort of feel the guard play. You could feel a tight end, you know, pull, something like that. So, like, when you're looking at J.D., the back steps to, to to J.D.'s left, and then J.D. steps to his right. Like, I don't know what he's looking at. You know, he's not mirroring the back. That big that big uh, touchdown run that they had where they just – Gabe Rubio got his ass kicked, and that happens. You know, he got folded up like a lawn chair. And Bertrand bit went the wrong direction. It's almost like went the wrong direction, and Kaiser couldn't get over the top. It's messy. So – I don't know what they're looking at. And then back to Marist. He'll key up. Well, this is Mike Marist playing as an inside linebacker because they let him play inside linebacker. They let him play outside linebacker. They let him play defensive end. I mean, they let him do everything. They're giving him ample opportunities to do something, to go shine, because we see the athletic ability and the length, but the potential in production, right, that's not matching up. Uh, Marist can't play inside linebacker. There is too much visually for him to process where like he'll see something and he steps the right way and he just doesn't seal the deal. He won't insert himself. I mean, go we rewatch the game like last, you know, last night he's catching blocks and he keeps hip tossing them. I mean, that was how Larry Maris stood out to me. He's just hip tossing offensive linemen once they'd already kind of completed their block. He plays okay. Maris, we're talking, plays okay on the edge because it's a simpler read. He's just reading out block, down block, and then he can kind of fill from there. Um, but, Mike, are we going to try and build a defense around a guy that has a lot of physical abilities but can't make a play? This is a great kind of question to ask me, which I know you're not really asking me because, again, this is your show. But I'm just – I'm kind of – I'm looking at the defensive stats – Nothing Alarming. jumps out here, right? There's literally nothing. It's just, eh, you're leading guys six tackles. It's not like someone had like two and a half sacks or a bunch of forced fumble, you know, multiple. And like, it's it's just, it's okay. It just seems it's like. It's kind of like, like, it's kind of, it's kind of bleh. But, bleh. but the results, I mean, in North Carolina scored 32, but, you know, mm-hmm. Notre Dame's defense, uh, had a couple, you know, busted coverages, but overall, I think was was, I think fairly good against North Carolina. Well, that credit's got to go to Al Golden then. But I'll let you finish your thought. I'm yeah. sorry, Mike. Marshall only scored 19. BYU 20. So it's like the defense. I feel like is having a good. Of course, Ohio <laughs> State. Notre Dame's the only team to hold Ohio State under what 45. So it's like the, the, the scoring. Uh, the scoring defense is good for this Notre Dame t- unit, but it's, it's, it's just like a group collective effort rather than just play. It's hard to plays. Like even Foskey, the best player on the, the team, you, you, or, you know, defense, you could argue. I mean, he's, he's not half enough. Well, Tariq Bracey is the best player on the defense. Okay. I mean, this many games into the season, I would put Foskey up there with, Marist in terms of the most physically gifted, you know, ought to be the best players on the team. And and Foskey's playing very hard. Keep me on track, Mike. Um, go back to Freeman's scheme when Freeman was the defensive co- coordinator. It was a lot of boom or bust. There was a lot of splash plays, a lot of chaos plays, wrecking havoc type deals. Um, 
but with that, you know, it's boom or bust. You leave yourself vulnerable to chunk plays. Whereas like, I feel like with Al Golden scheme, it's a little bit more of a conservative approach and it's more of a bend don't break type deal. Does that make sense? You're not going to get as many splash plays. Um, it's just more of a, yeah. Cause you're like, well, I guess defense kind of sucked, but I guess we played good. It's weird. Right. Cause nothing ever jumps off the screen at you, but that's doesn't forgive or it's not, it's, the lack of insertion and fitting fits run fits by the linebackers that doesn't there's no excuse for that you know it's not like free, it, it, golden's telling them to take a read step and then get caught and give up six yards of a, a, a play so but yeah you are playing a lot of young guys in the back end so some of those breakdowns in the past game are going to happen um but i'm just talking about like you know, I think we've said it before, man. It's like the, the core DNA of a linebacker is like see ball, get ball within reason. I mean, you have to play within the framework of the defense, but like for a, a starter that had as much hype as Marist has had to have, what will go two game, two tackles against Cal. I think he had six, um, six against North Carolina. And I think he had two this week. It's bad, you know, so the production has got to come and, um, I, and like I said, I mean, if, if Kali didn't just physically look the part and move so well and, and he made a play, got excited, it's like, dang, dude, he's earning the opportunity to get more reps. What year is Leofel now? Senior? He's probably a red shirt senior. If I had to say, like, he's probably got a fifth year available. Do you remember what your stats look like through your first five of games I do, of your Mike. senior season? Yeah. This is his fourth year. I, I might embarrassingly, yes, I know the I know real well how many tackles I had and all, all right, those through games. your first five games of your fourth year. Are you are you looking at it right now? I'm looking at Marist's. I don't have yours pulled up. I can try. Oh, where's Lou? Where's Lou? But I think I know, um, right? dude, I know we opened up against BYU and I had 12 tackles. And I can tell you I missed. I had two where I walked in on a blitz and try to hit the quarterback and like i should have had two tackles for loss that I, but i had 12 tackles in the byu game we played michigan early in the season i had 14 tackles i had three for loss and i don't i don't remember like i'm just telling you i think i probably averaged like eight a game and mike that was as a mike linebacker so my whole job was to spill the ball to the will and to the free safety or the, excuse me the strong safety so i was kind of like a fullback on defense there's maris number he's got 20 tackles through five games. In, in how many games? Five games? Yeah. yeah. So, and that's a that's at a will. And I, I've heard Tim talk about this at length. As a will, you are a free player. Tr typically speaking, you are covered up and it's just run and hit. You know, you really don't have much. It's You're a run-through player. You're a scrape-over-the-top player. It, there's not a lot of processing there. So, I just, I'm just telling you, I look at, I look at Kali's body. I look at his body language and he's hungry and the, the dude's a beast, man. He just is. JD Bertrand. He's, he's an NFL will linebacker. Go look at like Devin White playing for the, uh, the Bucks down there in Florida, Mike. Yep. Uh, the other kid that went to, uh, the Steelers from Michigan, Devin Bush, Devin Bush. I mean, he is a modern day. He's going to be a six foot one, two hundred thirty five pound kid that runs a four four eight at the combine, guaranteed. You know, he's just that. He's that dude. Yeah, Bertrand's got eighteen tackles, but he's also missed in four quarters due to targeting. So, well, tar but again, tackles are one thing. But you know, it's like JD's an effort guy, right? And it's it's hard to it's hard to to knock. It, in a way, it's hard to knock on him, but in, in another way, it's really easy. But a lot of that stuff's just effort stuff. I'm talking about you got to make a fit, okay? It's, you know, you got to come down, fill your A-gap, and make the tackle like Bo Bauer did early in the game. Great play, Bo. Great play. You know, and that's the one instance other than I think Kali had a nice stop. But outside of that, it's just a lot of catching. It's bad. All right. Let's uh, go to a sponsor in here from AuggiesLockerRoom.com. If you are looking for the perfect gift for that Notre Dame fan or for yourself, there's one place to go. And, of course, that is Augie's Locker Room. Located less than a mile away from Notre Dame Stadium, it was named the best Notre Dame collectibles in the country. If you are a passionate Notre Dame fan and are looking for that special Notre Dame piece to complete mm. your rec room 
go to augieslockerroom.com. Mike, you I know you must love the stuff at, at Augie's. I'm, I'm, I'm perusing. Christmas is coming there, Mike, you know? Yeah, they have a wide selection of Notre Dame stadium pieces, jerseys, helmets, autographs, one-of-a-kind rock knee items, exclusive Joe Montana signed items, and Augie mm. is partnering with famous sculptor Jerry McKenna to be the exclusive dealer of his Notre Dame bronze statues, the statues you've seen around the stadium. Augie has Jerry McKenna's artwork for sale in his store, and if Augie doesn't have it, he will find it for you, whatever you're looking for. So visit AugieslockerRoom.com or stop in if you're uh, in town, 1811 South Bend Avenue, and see the vintage helmet display dating back to 1890. AugieslockerRoom.com um, and uh, to call 574-277-NDND. Hmm. Mr. Goolsby, we're going we're gonna to talk a little Drew Pine. Um. Back in the spring game, you were, you know, you're you're pretty tough on him. You know, you know you comment a lot on his belly. Belly button. That, that fat shaming him a little bit. No, no, no. I would never. It was the it was my critique was belly button specific. Belly button specific. Um, yeah, I'm teasing. Is there anything that you feel like you were wrong about Drew Pine in your criticisms previously? to now no or is it a complete he he is who we thought he is but I mean, we will see said, we will see we will see when he gets tested in a clemson game or we collectively as a team get te tested can he rise up so i've said on the text chain with you and tim you little pot stirrer mike folks this kid singer on these text chains Make my blood pressure go up, but uh, Tim gets Tim so easily riled up at the end of our show last night. Sure. I'm like, Tim, keep the same energy as this group text, and he just doesn't. He doesn't. So, I equated Drew Pine to a Toyota Camry, right? I nice car, best selling car in the world, honestly. Yeah, man, nice car, good gas mileage, safe. Um, we'll you know, we'll see about Drew's reliability. But it's just it's a good car. It's a good all around car. And that's what we got with Drew. Drew is serviceable. Is is Buckner like the sports car that breaks down then? Is he like a unfortunately, okay. yeah. Yeah. I think Buckner is a bit of a concept car still. It's still in production, right? Because we don't the whole offense, when when we saw Tyler Buckner, the whole offense was still like in production. Like what were we? He was the offense. And you know, he's having to play at the at the shoe primetime game, his first start. I, I'm on record, man. I think that we kind of did Tyler dirty in terms of how we his career at Notre Dame started out. Um, but yeah, I think Drew Pine's been serviceable. But like, uh, play play it out with me, Mike. Like, if okay. Michael Mayer goes down with a, you know, and, and I'm not even going to speak it into the universe. I'm like knocking on wood. Michael Mayer gets nicked up in the first quarter of this BYU game, so we lose his lose him as 50 percent of the offense. What's Drew Pine going to do then? So you need truck or trailer, you know, like you, we'll see. But he's been very serviceable. He's played competent. I think the execution around him is is much better. I mean, Mike, there were times back there. I mean, you could have – Um, I mean, he was like he had three, four, five, six seconds to get rid of the ball. And he still threw it to Mare, unironically. Um, but so we, yeah, when the seat gets a little bit hotter, when the lights get a little bit brighter, that Clemson game, then we'll know, you know, what Drew Pine's kind of made of. All right. So I, again, yeah. I'm rooting for him, Yeah. but I just don't, I don't see him as anything special or dynamic. Maybe, you know, again, I just don't like the fact that, you know, his his best traits are always taught discussed like they're they're uh they're intangible it's his leadership it's his whatever it's it's nothing tangible when you talk about his strengths as a quarterback and i know like moxie and you know leadership and all that stuff i know it matters um but you know physical tools matter as well for you folks on youtube this is of course his stats um through um you know the four games that he has played this fall i think serviceable my two thoughts on what you're saying i think serviceable is a little a little harsh because i think okay. 
I mean, completing 73% of his passes, nine touchdowns, and two picks. Pretty, I mean, for sure. It's and also, and also, if you take Mayor out, I don't care who the quarterback is. I mean, Buckner, Book, Kaiser. I feel like maybe Brady Quinn is is still having success with this offense. It's it's. I mean, he's got one truly fantastic. Like passing weapon. Weapon, weapon, and then otherwise, I, okay, he does have Braden Lindsay. That's your favorite player on the team. Um, you know, Jaden Thomas had what as many catches this season as you did interceptions in your career going into the game. You know, like yeah. So yeah, Jaden Thomas looks good too, dude. We'll talk about. He looks him. like we'll, we'll get. To I mean, he, next. I let's, okay, him. we'll put a we'll put a. A pin in that, but um, I got some crow to eat. I, I, I'm I'm fine eating crow. I just wanted to see if you would still eat any crow, Mike. Or- I think uh, no. Like I said, I mean, I I don't think I was wrong about Drew Pine and that, folks. I'm always going to root for our starting quarterback. I'm always going to root for him. Um, I just think that Tyler had a better arm, a quicker release, and he's a much more dynamic offense. So it's like, or you know, just weapon in terms of like the duality, what he can do with that position. But if Drew gets as much time. I mean, put uh, you know Paulus's son in there. If if if, if Ron Paulus the second gets as much time as Drew Pine did in this po- in this last game against BYU and their quote unquote like pass rush, he's going to complete at least fifty percent of his throws. These guys are schemed open, Mike. You know, it's like that one. Uh, I think it was Mayor's second touchdown run. He kind of runs that stop and go one on one. Beautiful ball, Drew. Perfect pass, but Drew takes that snap. And he's waiting on Mike to get open, waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting. And I mean, there was no reading. There was no, you know, processing going through his progression. No, I was like, no, I'm throwing it here. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to kiss the ring. I'm just saying, objectively speaking, when you give a quarterback three to five seconds, plus a really, really, really substantial running game, this is what you get. And it comes back to coach Reese's offense and what you can get with some execution, man. Yeah, I mean they're rushing three so a good bit. So I mean, yeah, you're just gonna have. I mean, we're rolling with Drew Pine. We're rolling with Drew Pine, and we're sticking with him. We're rolling with him. We're he's three and zero. I love to see it, but the challenge is going to be in some of these matchups that win this Clemson matchup when you're playing a, a an elite level team. What can he do? Because sometimes that's where like a physical gift is gonna is gonna get you through. Right. And I don't know if he has those yet. So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Just a couple more thoughts and then you can rebuttal or move on. Let's see if I can remember them now. As a You're going to die on this Drew Pine Hill. I love it. I love it, man. If everyone was praising him, I wouldn't say anything. It's, it's you mm-hmm. know, it's, 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 I don't know, dude. Um, what do you, what, what do you want from people, Mike? You know, like, because everybody was kind of down on Pine for obvious reasons. He's small. He's a limited athlete, like for obvious reasons. So what do you want from people? Uh, to give credit where credit is due? Yeah, I was going to say consistency, credit, credit where credit is due. Yeah, See, okay. The two things that I'd push back a little bit more on is the Buckner's probably maybe got a little bit of stronger arm than Pine. I don't know if it's much. I mean, when have we really seen Buckner just sling the ball? You know, I don't know, Mike, because when he was playing, he had freaking Ohio State defenders sitting in his lap. And the quick release thing, man, I'll take give me Pine throwing like Pine is just his throwing motion, his mechanics. I'll take that over Buckner. Um, and then there's one other thing I can't remember now. That was destined to happen. But- I always forget. No, it's fine. So I think the, the the gist of what you're getting at is to give credit where credit is due. And I'm doing that. And I, like I said, um, I think Pine's playing great, but it's it's almost like practice. I mean, you have, UNC's defense is laughably bad. They were horrendous, right? I mean, you had guys running wide open, like guys who were playing man coverage and getting confused on I, UNC's. I, I just feel like it's, oh, well, he's getting all this time, so it's kind of like a knock on him. So it's like, well, you, you still got to make those throws. It's a, it's a team game. It's like, oh, well, we'll see what he's like against Clemson and uh, USC, but like how have all the Notre Dame quarterbacks in the past decade fared against you know the big companies? So, so I just feel like they're 
if Buckner were still starting and his stats were completing 73% of his passes, nine touchdowns, two picks, it would be, oh, my God, he's just the best. We've got the next Brady Quinn. And I just – so I think that might be where it's coming from, that I feel like if this were Buckner, everyone would be goo goo gaga. But since Pine's 5'11", and he's got, a, you know, an ugly belly button, people aren't too excited. I don't know. I'm, I'm not even – I, I don't even have any thoughts on the looks of Pine's belly button. I didn't get that. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying there's the fact that it was hanging out. That was the 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 crux of my issue there. But, I mean, again, the, the Buckner conversation, it's put to bed. I mean, until like next season or whatever. But I thought Buckner played well. I mean, Buckner's first completion this season, he got rocked. Remember his first that pass out to Styles? Like he got smoked right in the face mask, gets up, probably runs for six yards the next play. So I'm just telling you, I mean, if you gave uh like even so Pine had a little scramble, you know, where he faked out, you know, Charlie Weiss and shoulder pads, right? He's got a 375 <laughs> pound nose tackle chasing him down. And Pine manages to like juke him out and like fall backwards for a first down. I wasn't impressed by that. It's like, forgive me. You know, so I'm rooting for him, but Tyler Buckner is the more talented quarterback. End of story. It's terms of physical talent. It's not even. Yeah, Jamarcus Russell was a very physical, talented quarterback, you know, so it don't work out. Yeah, but he also, yeah, I mean, he was. What are we talking about? Of course he was. He's way more talented than Drew Pine. He's the first pick overall. You know, so if you were a GM, right? So that if you're the GM, this is ten years from now. Two is retiring, right? Drew Pine, a Drew Pine comes available in the draft, a 197 pound quarterback uh, with a noodle for an arm. You taking him because he's because he's confident. You, you are you drafting Baker Mayfield first overall? Hell no. Okay, well then now you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. You need a quarterback. Who are you taking then? If you're not Dude, taking I'm Baker. Just- I'm just saying you you can have more talent but not be as good as a quarterback as the other guy. So what makes up what what closes that gap? That you know that lack of talent what 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 what's going in there to fill that in? Production. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Consistency. Right. Um well, but Tyler was the entire offense, though. Just to be clear, leading rusher, leading passer, everything, right? So yeah, that was production. Throw, oh, I hope he. Was they the couldn't run the ball. They couldn't run the ball. They couldn't, run the, the they, they couldn't run the ball, and they couldn't throw the ball because we have well, no receivers. Well, though they were also putting like Ohio State was loading up the box and saying, "Throw it, throw it." To who? <laughs> so, to, to who? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Okay, and then how many? How many of those? How many of those deep balls did we miss, Lindsay? On four to six, up from, like off the top of my head, and we saw we've saw, seen how many deep balls from Pine. One, in, in my recollection, it was an underthrown jump ball to a six four Jaden Thomas, right? So it's like we try. Tyler had the ability to push the ball deep, and it's Braden Lindsay is the common denominator in there that you can't complete that pass. Furthermore, Tyler never had any time. You had. What's his face? Patterson playing on one foot, wasn't playing, and then he's playing on one foot for a number of games. So he's just getting all this stuff in his face, and then you're not executing fault. I mean, again, to compare the two instances of Tyler's, you know, two games at quarterback versus Drew's, you know, two and a half games at quarterback, they're not equal just because the offensive line play is markedly better now than it was to start the season. So we got to move on, Mike. Drew Ooh, I got fired up there, dude. See? Talk about it all. We can talk about it all day long. Yeah. Um, Walsh up. If you had a question, um, please drop it in the comments and we will get to it. Um, D3GA says, if Pine is starter day one, is the record any different? I say they have one more win and better chance against Ohio State. It's something you kind of talked about earlier, Mike. Okay. What's So if Pine is a starter day one, is the record any different? Um, I disagree. And I kind of, in, in hindsight, I sort of want, it'd be fun to be like the, the experience to be like, we're going to roll Drew out to start the season with the intent of having Tyler become the starter throughout the course, just get him more reps. Right. I mean, cause he had played very little football in his you know career, literally up to this point. 
But I don't think you could have played Drew in those early games because our offensive line was so bad. I just don't think you could have. Um, and we, we had no running game. We weren't creating any sort of movement. And we were leaky and specifically interior-wise on our pass protection. So that's why you had Tyler out there to create some yardage with his legs because we didn't have a traditional running game in terms of like handing it off to a back. And you needed the escapability, the athleticism. So you sort of like you always had Tyler was like almost like a sacrificial lamb against Ohio State um, because the offensive line was so bad. Didn't they blitz him a good bit? Hell yeah. yeah! Our our left guard, center, right guard. It was a turnstile, and we couldn't pick up anything. Like all the the cross dog blitz that Notre Dame runs. Literally, Mike. We blitz our linebackers almost every single play, and it's the same thing. So, you know, early in the season, we were seeing that uh, versus us on on offense, and we couldn't pick it up. So, I think I think to as far as that super chat, the question is concerned. Just to expand on that a bit more, I think take the quarterback out of the equation. I think had we stuck to the ground and pound bully ball in the second half and even in like a Marshall type game, you could be undefeated. You know, we kind of, we went into the first half of Ohio State, we're gonna smash mouth, bloodbath, and then we got lost. And then we took us a game and a half to find our identity. So had you just rolled that out and just played gritty football and won by a field goal, you might be undefeated. But we got cute. We were going empty, Mike. We were going empty earlier in the season. Now we now we we're playing three tight ends and we're just playing bully ball. We'll move along. I agree. Walsh up says I want to arm Russell Goolsby. That was his comment with the with, with the super chat. I'll I i do not know you Walsh up, but I'll take Goolsby. Hans I'm not said, getting into it. My psychiatrist tells me Notre Dame's linebackers do run fits like this on purpose, but I still think they do but I still think they do so, so I go berserk in my living room. Which is it? I think there's um. Am I missing a word? Is there a typo in here? My I let's 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 play this out. So he's saying that they are intentionally screwing it up, but I still think they do so. I'm gonna say, uh, get a new psychologist. There you go. Any comments on the? linebackers and their run fits Mike I know that's something that you've pitched a fit about it's it's uh, it's one of those things I we sometimes you wish you could just sit in a meeting room and like what are they being taught because and, and then your your head coach is a defensive guy ex linebacker himself you know Al Golden's a great defensive coordinator came from the NFL he's got all the experience you need so it's like you know what are they teaching these kids where the, again, I see Maris step in the right direction, then he freezes, then we start catching. And I don't know if they're teaching him. I hate to get into like X's and O's and be like that guy, but like that reduced technique where you set an offensive lineman up and then you slip the block, Maris should be doing that all day long. With as, as, as athletic as he is, you know, but instead we're catching blocks and he's trying to throw them off after the tackle's been made by somebody else. So, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know what to do. So I don't know if it's a personnel issue that, like, okay, Kali needs to play just because he's better, or if it's a technique thing. Uh, but football's not that complicated. I mean, there's six gaps: A's, B's, C's, and you can. I guess you could count a D gap. And I got a three technique in my my B gap, and I've got a nose in my A. So the Mike needs to fill the strong side A, and the weak needs the Will needs to fill the weak side B. And if we move the defensive line, then we need to fit off of that. It's not rocket science. I just don't know why they do it or don't fill. I don't. So Jaden Thomas, six receptions, 106 yards in the touchdown. Um, you know, had a quick reception against Marshall for eight yards, caught a couple balls against North Carolina. And then, I mean, I, I, I don't remember if it was a show with you or Tim Hyde. I'm like, what's the point of Jaden Thomas being on the field? Like he's he doesn't get the ball. He's just he's just a decoy. You know, I feel like no one's even gonna really respect him because you're not put him on the field, but not throwing it to him. And uh, that that touchdown reception that was a playmaker. Uh, you know, a player making a play, making a play. 
Letting his, you know uh, what, hang, bro. Letting him hang. Going out there, be, you know, and he looks great. And then he got, you know, two catches to follow. I think he had three catches in total. So he's going to be a unique, unique weapon for a young kid to be that big, to be 6'4, 215. That's a big kid. And then he ain't two, six, four. That's for sure. He's like 6'2. But you did, think? I not say I Jayden, saw, did I say something else? Because everyone in the comments. Said, I heard you say Jaden Thomas. Oh, okay. All right. Continue. Sorry, Mike. Boy, those guys are a tough crowd, huh? Everyone's just commenting Jaden. Oh my god. Yeah, I know. Oh, you might have said Jalen. Oh, okay. Sorry. Whatever. I heard Jaden. I think yeah, well, I saw him because I was kind of like watching on the rewatch this afternoon. I'm like, how tall is he? And uh Michael Mayer is taller than me in person. Six, six, Michael Mayer is probably six five. I dude, I'm telling you, he looks well, as long as he is, he looks like he's six three to me. So I just think he could be like he could be like a Debo Samuel type underneath kind of break tackles kind of guy. He's interesting, but he's not like a true deep ball guy. Like, a, I mean, we don't have one on our team, but I would say Lindsey. So he's going to be kind of an underneath guy, kind of in that Mike Singer uh, <laughs> possession type receiver. Except for Mike Singer couldn't go up and moss somebody. Yeah. So underthrown ball, a beautiful underthrown ball by Drew. We'll call it a back shoulder, uh, but it looked like an underthrown ball. But again, young kid that doesn't know any better other than to go make a play. So, and he got rewarded for it beyond. Holden Stays had a catch. It's nice to see. So, yeah, Coach Reese has fe- figured out a way to kind of scheme people open. Um, and as long as that protect, I mean, if that protect protection stays the way it is. Uh, the offense should look great. And we haven't even talked about the running backs. Oh, that's next. Okay. That's next. So Thomas, when he was in that 2021 recruiting class for Notre Dame with Lorenzo Styles and Deion Colsey, Thomas was you know, supposed to be the number three guy, right? And I thought he was going to end up at safety. I didn't think he was, I didn't think that his, his best upside was that receiver. He struggled with drops in his career. Um, he had some, I like his twitchiness, but just kind of a raw, um, getting a phone call from Tallahassee right now. Um, kind of, kind of just raw, not very refined. He's, he's proved me wrong. I think he's mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, he's, what are we five games into this kid's career, right? He's, he was the first one to get on the field out of that. Well, I guess behind styles. Um, yeah, they both played last year a little bit, Styles and Colsey. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and even Colsey's Colsey's still out there getting some getting in the rotation. But I just look at the way I look at the way he moves around. He's a long strider. Uh, I think he you could do a lot of stuff with him underneath. Um, this he's going to have the size to kind of bounce off linebackers and stuff like that. So I'm kind of a uh, not that I'm going to become anoint myself as the president of his fan club quite yet, Mike, but I'm, <laughs> I will be, I will be intrigued to see what his career turns into. Cause he just seems like a, a different kind of weapon. So on, on the screen for YouTube folks, we have the snap counts pulled up. We'll leave up the offense for a second, then go to defense. Um, the running back snaps, Mike Tyree 29 digs, 29 estimate 26. So it kind of felt like they're feeding the hot hand a little bit. Times it was yeah. digs, times his estimate. Tyree struggled a little bit. You know, I think he'd still be running if he caught that screen. Um, Tobias Merriweather got three snaps. Everyone rejoice. Um, but yeah, let's talk about those running backs, Mike, because <laughs> they were, I mean, digs and estimate. Thank you, Lance Taylor, right? I mean, estimate 14 rushes, 97 yards, dig 17 for 93 um, with, with some clutch runs, man. Yeah. A um, couple just obscure thoughts. Somebody out there knows this, but like that field, because this is field turf, did they have to like lay down a new field for this game or did they, can you paint over field turf? Because it's an NFL stadium. Those end zones look, Beautiful, by the way. I loved it. The 3D Irish graphic looked fantastic. But I asked that because uh, Tyree like couldn't get his 
footing. Like he kept like getting stuck, like almost in the turf. And I'm like, is that new turf? And you know, he's kind of a start, start, stop type guy, but he really just struggled with his footing. And it was like the opposite of playing on a slick field. It was almost like he was playing on, like he had Velcro on the bottom of his shoes. It was strange to watch. I felt bad for him in a way. Um, but SMA, man, and we we kind of talked about this. Like, I think he was sort of a dark horse. He was obviously a dark horse. I know he was committed to Michigan State. He wasn't like a like very lauded over recruit. Just kind of slipped into the recruiting class. And, you know, throughout the spring and stuff, he's kind of making a name for himself. Lost a little bit of weight. I mean, physically, he's he's super impressive to to stand next to, just real deep chested. But that's two games in a row where Estime is almost rushed for 100 yards, you know, 100 plus against UNC and close to in, in this game. Dare I say, like, Estime is kind of becoming like a Kyron Williams in terms of like the heartbeat of the team sure. and his level of confidence. And Diggs is starting to creep up too. And I'm not at all discounting Diggs, but I just watched it. Estimate's body language and hear me out, Mike. It's at the end of the game. We're ostensibly we're in a victory formation. Estimate starts doing this, you know, getting the crowd right. It's kind of the uh the crescendo to the game. Like we won, we're in victory formation. And then Chris Tyree is watching Estimate do the pump up thing, and Chris Tyree's just kind of shaking his head, looking at Estimate. And it was almost like a passing of the torch, and that like Tyree. In that moment, to me, the first time I saw it live, I was like, Tyree knows that Estime is the man now in terms of, like, he's your running back. It was interesting to watch. Go back and watch it at the end of the game. Tyree's just like, yep. So, I don't know. I think that if, if, if what Freeman said in the locker room and that, you know, our DNA and our, our culture is built around offensive line and defensive line, I mean, Audrey Estime just – He's almost like an extension of an of the of the offensive line in terms of like the way he plays and the physicality and the toughness and um, he's real confident. And I heard press clippings, you know, press conference cut ups and things of him during spring ball and summer camp, and that's what really jumped out to me is how confident he is um, for such an inexperienced kid. Um, and I'm just I'm a really big fan of of Estime and the toughness. And just kind of the heart, you know. So, Mike, you had wrote in your notes, you want me us to acknowledge some kids that are stepping up. Talk yeah. about there, obviously, Thomas, Diggs, Estime, Kaiser, Collie. We talk about Kaiser. Are we talking about Kaiser much? No. Kaiser and Jason Adamolola. Now, yeah. I, I, I want you to touch on Kaiser, but then when we talk about Adamolola, I want to go to some context on this interior defensive line that Jacob Lacey announces he's transferring and it's ironic because we weird, were, right? Yeah. Due to playing time and he would have easily been Notre Dame's featured nose tackle because Howard Cross was out. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, j next to that nose tackle spot, Jason Adam Alola, you know, leading Notre Dame's. Let's see. Cam Hart had more snaps at 39, but otherwise it looks like, um, Jason Adamola had the second most snaps on that defense at 38. Um, thoughts on Jason Adamola in that interior defensive line because they definitely missed Cross and Lacey, you know, as the, the BYU rushing attack started gashing them. And then um, Jack Kaiser, Mike. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, um, in terms of like Lacey leaving, I don't begrudge anybody to do that. I mean, it's, it's, in a way, man, I bet you it's almost more difficult for a kid like that to transfer out of a program like a Notre Dame than it is to to stay and like lose some reps. I mean, that's a big decision that I know probably weighed really heavy on his heart. And if that's what he thought he needed to do for his career, then um, I truly I wish him well, but because I know how difficult of a decision that was. The timing is strange, but you know, to preserve the year of eligibility, I understand it. Um. But yeah, Adam Adam Iola decided it was like I'm going to show up today, and he played violent football, and he was one of a handful of players on defense, maybe two or three that kind of jumped off the screen. Um, you know, his play of the game was that fourth and one, and they did a great job. You know, with the kind of the the camera, the top down camera, and I'm sitting there going, man, we got a 280 <laughs> 280 pound kid playing nose in like a fourth and one. 
against the BYU 300 plus pound offensive lineman. I was like, boy, is that less than ideal for us just in terms of the lack of beef, but he made a play. Um, but Howard Cross has been missed. He's been, you know, quite the motor for us on, on defense in terms of maybe a defensive heartbeat, consistent level of play. But we don't need him back for the next couple of weeks, so let him heal up um, and let him shine in that Clemson game uh, is, would be my advice. I like Gabe Rubio in there. Like another kid that plays hard probably doesn't quite know what he's doing, but just physically he's so much bigger. He's just a bigger human being. And I'd love to see Gabe get up to like just a big sloppy, just 320, just pack it on, man. Like if he's 290 now, just, I don't need you to do much. Just be, I need you to be 300 plus for the remainder of your career. Cause we haven't had one of those just, you know, maulers in the middle of our defense. And he's the closest thing that we have maybe to it. Yeah. And, Ky- and Kaiser, yeah. um, I, he's, he's always been a nice player. He, he tends to make plays, you know, throughout his career. Like you kind of don't notice them. And some of that is due to these, these kids. They all look identical, especially with those white and yellow <laughs> with the gold numbers on the white Jersey. Like when I watch the game, when I watch the linebackers very intently, Mike, for the life of me, half the time, I can't make out who Kaiser is and who Bertrand is. They look like the same person physically. But Kaiser tends to kind of like hide and he plays pretty well, but then he'll show up and make an interception or make a, a timely sack or something like that. So, um, and that poor kid has been all over the place. They started him out at Rover. Now he's back to play. Now he's playing Mike. So clearly he's an intelligent guy. He can read a playbook, understand a team, uh, a, a defensive scheme like holistically. So you can kind of plug him in. But he's not a Mike physically, and then he's probably better served to play Will to me. But you've got Marist and Kali in the mix as well. So to me, he'd like be like he's an athletic, smart, better athlete than JD. So I think that ultimately his best fit would be probably at the Mike to me. Let's wrap this thing up. Let's talk about kind of what's next, Mike, because the Fighting Irish are uh, three and two now. Got a couple of very winnable games, Stanford, UNLV. At Syracuse at the end of the month could be tricky. I mean, it's at the Carrier Dome. I feel like that might be. We lost there when when I was there. I wasn't playing. I was hurt that year. But, yeah, they beat us up in 2003. Weird place to play, Mike, maybe? Yeah, I think it's – well, Syracuse is one of those programs like a Boston College. Some of these programs are kind of like giant killers. You know, they'll go six and six or whatever, but they've got it in their DNA to like upset a team. Clemson before, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see. And I know that that Carrier Dome can get rocking, but that's going to be kind of a lunch pail game. Don't do anything crazy. Just lean on them all game. We have better players. It would probably be a similar type game to like a BYU. Just don't mess it up, you know. Yeah. And you just, you know, don't want to be looking ahead to Clemson the next week, um, but yeah, should be should be six and two team going into Clemson. Mm-hmm. What ranked number four or five right now in the? AP yeah, what a weird year for college football. It what really a weird year because your, your, your top like five. There's this is true. This is true. Well, teams continue to get better, right? But I mean, at this point, like you watch a Michigan, like is that a top? Is like the number three or four team in the country? Is Alabama, right? I mean. So teams continue to get better as we have. Um, well, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to be at the Clemson game, so I'm looking forward to it. So here's the um, here's the AP poll. Yeah, it's just it's like it feels weird. UCLA is the number eleven team. Oklahoma State, Ole Miss in the top ten. Tennessee's back. Is USC hmm. back? It's just like oh, there's Kansas. Is this an old top 24? Kansas is still number 19. Is this right? Could be. Well, I don't know, Mike. You pulled it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. This was tweeted out by on three six hours ago. So well, that's gotta be accurate. Yeah. This is like you know, weird. Wake Forest, TCU, and top 15. It's like, where's Notre Dame? Oklahoma. But that's just the way it goes. I mean, the yeah, these SEC schools, they kind of don't really sink into their schedule till later on, but 
you know me, Mike. I've never been a it, – it sucks to not see a Notre Dame program ranked. It's like, ugh, it's brutal, right? But, I mean, I've watched Oregon play, average football team, Wake Forest, average football team, uh, Tennessee, semi-average football team, Michigan, average football team, Penn State, average football team to me. Um, and, I, yeah, I mean, I think on any given Saturday we could beat any of these teams. And we, we gave the number two team – a run for their money and we forgot to play the second half so we'll see how it shakes out but i think everything's trending in the right way i was asked this weekend what do notre dame fans think of marcus freeman which i thought was huh like what a poignant question and i'm like well i think it's to be determined i think we have to have faith in him and i think the recruiting class the recruiting that's gonna way heavily on how I feel about Mike Marcus Freeman as a head coach. But um, it's one game at a time. You know me, man. That's how I've always, I've always looked at things. And uh, Notre Dame hosts Stanford. 7.30 kick. These night games kill me, man. Well, right? 7.30. Well, you're cl- clearly not a player. I mean, as a player, you'd prefer to be playing at nighttime. Oh, no? I'm a player. So... You just crush a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dropping a big pun reference. Yeah. You know the song. I'm not a player. I just crush a lot. No. I don't think so. <laughs> I'll send it to you. I'll send you. A, I'll send it to you. When we get off the. I mean, I was up till two thirty last night, and then up. You know. Prime your river, dude. All right, let's wrap it up. You heard the man. Appreciate everybody for watching, listening. Head to blueandgold.com. Make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video. Um, and, uh, of course, if you're listening via podcast, leave a, uh, a kind review. Appreciate everyone. This has been the Mike Goolsby Show, blueandgold.com. Appreciate everyone, and uh, we will catch you next time. We will do, We will have a Goolsby Show next Sunday, Mike. Yeah, you're good? Yeah, Mar- yeah Sunday, 6, 6 Central time. That's what, we're, that's what we've settled on. I like it. All right, we'll have our usual lineup of YouTube videos this week. Tim Hyde and I will go live after the game on on Saturday against Stanford. Yeah, Goolsby and I will be on Sunday. Appreciate everyone, and we'll catch you next time.